Hey guys, and welcome back to the Ether Hub. I'm Simon, bringing you the stories of Magic the Gathering. Out of all the characters in MTG, no one was more set up for a massive defeat and honorable death than the white aligned planeswalker of the Gatewatch and original founder Gideon Jora. Oftentimes, though, a character's death doesn't exactly mean the end. Today we'll explore what exactly happened to Gideon Jora, his tragic struggle, heroic sacrifice, and if there could be a possible return. What exactly happened to Gideon Jora? Before we answer that question though, just for the Vorthos army, I'll be doing a giveaway for this video. So stay tuned till the end to find out how to enter for a chance to win a copy of Gideon Blackblade. And now let's get into the lore. The tale of Gideon Jora is a classic warning of the downfall hubris can have on a champion, how quickly arrogance can bring even the mightiest low, and the role fate plays on a character's development. Gideon's development started on his native plane of Theros, under his Therizin name, Kithian. In his humble beginnings, he ran with a gang known as the Irregulars, skilled but unregulated fighters who looked out for the poor and downtrodden of their home, the Polis of Akros. Though noble, they were still vigilantes and Gideon was arrested and sent to prison. There, his skill, courage, and honor was recognized by the prison warden, Hyksus. He believed in Gideon's potential for good, and that belief blossomed into the heromancy magic we see Gideon wielding in all of his recent appearances. The shield magic and whips enhanced with light, it's basically binding magic. With Gideon's training complete, the city of Akros is attacked by a band of Cyclopses and Harpies. Gideon heroically gathers his Irregulars to defend his home. They're officially recognized as certifiable heroes, much like Hercules, the animated movie minus Danny DeVito making a cameo. With Gideon's newfound notoriety, he's approached by the sun god Heliod, the most powerful of the Theros pantheon, to become his champion. Gideon agrees, and his hubris only grows. As Heliod's champion, Gideon and his Irregulars were tasked with bringing down an avatar of Erebos, the god of death and the underworld on Theros. Heliod and Erebos have been bitter enemies since their very creation, and Heliod wanted this monstrosity destroyed. Gideon was given a godly spear to do the job, and they went to work. The Titan was easy enough to slay with the enchanted spear of Nyx, but in Gideon's arrogance, he believed he could do more. He turned his eyes to the god of death himself. He threw the spirit Erebos. Gods of Theros are nothing to mess with. They're the embodiment of aspects, the collective faith and devotion of all beings on Theros made manifest. Even Heliod's spear could do nothing, and Erebos swatted it away as easily as a gnat. And believing himself equal to a god, for putting himself above others and endangering them for his own pride, Erebos taught the young Gideon a powerful lesson. That one cannot defy fate that one, no matter how powerful, can be so arrogant to forsake others. With a flick of his impossibly long whip, a crash of black magic surrounded Gideon. His invulnerable shield protected him, of course, as Erebos intended. That wasn't the point. The point was the collateral damage his actions caused. Gideon looked around to see nothing but ash, where once his irregulars, his beloved friends, those he led to battle, were just moments ago. He had failed them. He hadn't protected anyone. It would be this event that led to Gideon's hero complex. The idea that he needs to protect all others no matter the cost, and making a lot of his actions seem suicidal because it would forever put him on a death wish. This tragedy would ignite his spark, and he traveled to Bant where his name was changed from Kithian to Gideon. A simple mispronunciation by the natives on the plane. That's the history Gideon has, on Theros with the gods, and how this character became so motivated to sacrifice everything he has for others. He seeks redemption for this one folly, and many other follies to come. Failures he can't escape from. That leads us to his final battleground, the last war, and his concluding fight on the plane of Ravnica facing down the god dragon Nicol Bolas. Gideon's plan was simple, but too singularly focused. It all relied on him using an ancient weapon called Blackblade that the Gatewatch had recovered on the plane of Dominaria. 
Gideon used this cursed blade to suck the life essence from the demon lord Belzenlock. It could certainly do the job, and Gideon, of course, had to be the one to wield it. His hero complex demanded it, but also his shield would prove useful when charging down a dragon god. Despite Nicol Bolas having already proven he could pierce this shield when they faced on Amon Ketz, but hey, Gideon always wanted to forget his failures and it looks like he forgot that one here. As Gideon hacks his way through the scores of undead Eternals who make up Bolas' forces, Gideon tests the Black Blade's god-killing potential on the eternalized Amon Ket god, Ronus literally shattering the essence of the god eternal and tipping the fight in the Ravnikan's favor. This plan could possibly work. Banking on his previous experience working with the militant angels of the Boros Legion or Ravnica, Gideon mounted a trusty Pegasus and flew into battle. One strike is all he needed. Fighting an aerial battle with the angels against eternal Avon warriors, Gideon spotted his target and advanced. However, another god eternal would intervene. Oketra, the god Gideon respected most of all on Amenket, the one that had him believe in the benevolence of gods once again after losing faith in those on Theros. God Eternal Oketra took aim with her bow and pierced the heart of Gideon's mount. His plan had seemingly failed. Yet, as he tumbled through the air, his feet found purchase. An ally had scooped him up mid-fall. It was a new, unlikely mount. The Demon Lord Rakdos, chaotic leader of the Rakdos Guild on Ravnica. The demon had no love being ridden like a show pony, but the idea of a foreign usurper to his throne of chaos enraged the demon more. Rakdos would carry Gideon and the Black Blade over to Bolas. From there, Gideon made his final desperate plunge. Again, Gideon's hubris would be his downfall. Throughout his history, Erebos, Oketra, gods have predicted his downfall. They would not be the only gods Gideon would face. And once again, he's face to face with a god in Nicol Bolas. His courage, his pride, his hero complex would fail him. Bolas had planned for this exact event. He knew that the Gatewatch would find the cursed Blackblade and use it as a last ditch effort to kill him. He knew they would focus on this one solution and have no backup. With preparations made, Bolas countered the attack used magic to shatter the blade, and left Gideon defeated on the cold surface of Ravnica. Gideon's triumph, though, wouldn't come from being a hero. It wouldn't come from throwing himself at a god. Pride must be given up. His redemption, the one thing he was searching for his entire life, would come when Gideon sacrificed himself for Ravnica. As the necromancer Liliana Vest turned on her former master by sending his own Eternals against Bolas, the god dragon voided Liliana's contract for her soul, burning her and ending her life. Gideon, however, steps in at this point. Seeing Liliana has the power to turn this fight, and with nothing left to give, Gideon gives her his own invulnerable shield. As a result, Liliana's contract burned through him instead, turning the hero to dust and leaving nothing more but his plate armor behind. As a direct result of his sacrifice, the heroes of Ravnica were able to defeat Bolas and free the multiverse from his budding tyranny. That is what happened to Gideon Jorah. His build-up and fall, sacrifice and redemption. Finally protecting everyone. But what, if anything, could be in the future for Gideon Jorah? Is he really gone? At the very end of Gideon's life, as death is approaching, he flashes back to a memory. His irregulars, those he had let down so long ago on Theros, that started him on this journey of redemption. The card, Heartwarming Redemption, shows Gideon seeing a vision of his comrades and feels at peace as he finally falls and the cursed contract ends his life. This card and its art depicts a touching self-forgiveness for Gideon. Not that he was actually in the underworld of Theros at that moment. Remember, the Theros underworld doesn't look like this. This was Gideon forgiving himself for his failures. A lot of people interpret this card as proof positive of Gideon's soul going back to Theros. But that just isn't the case. At least not from what I could find. The question then needs to be asked. Can a soul travel from Ravnica to Theros? It's known that souls basically go to the blind eternity for most planes, and Ravnica at this point has no barrier, preventing souls and spirits from leaving the plane like it had before. The only ones staying do so with the Orzhov. 
but them entering the blind eternity like a planeswalker doesn't guarantee that they can travel to a specific plane. Like his ghost didn't just say, oh, okay, back to Theros, I guess, and poof, it was there. This is the part of Gideon's story that has caused a lot of contention as people don't want Gideon to be done with and want to see a real redemption and possibly resurrection, especially as we return to Theros and Theros beyond death. And while it could happen, they would need to go into deep details on how souls actually work in MTG because it's really vague. The only mention of Gideon and Theros in War of the Spark is a discussion to take his now dusty armor back to Theros, where the planeswalkers built up a memorial for the fallen hero. There was no body to return, no captured spirit, so unless he was tied to his armor for some unknown reason, there was no plan to get Gideon to Theros, only a memorial service. Is it possible that one day Gideon will come back? It's magic, so of course it's possible. Could Gideon somehow be resurrected as a new god on Theros? Maybe replacing Heliod if he gets deposed in Theros Beyond Death? I mean, Gideon is a hero, and he is white aligned, so it makes sense? But still, an unknown hero who died on an unknown plane in an unknown war would need an impossible amount of devotion from the citizens of Theros to become a god, and I just don't see that realistically happening with Gideon at this point. But like comic books, never count the dead character out. But with his story finally meeting a conclusion, with all of his prophecies finally coming true, and not to mention being the only meaningful death in the whole War of the Spark, sorry Domri Raid, I believe they'll let sleeping dogs lie, at least for a little bit. Gideon right now is resting, finally at peace. So yeah guys, it may be dark, but Gideon's tragic story and ultimate redemption seems to be the stopping point for Gideon's tale. But don't be bummed out, you can take Gideon home as a memorial with a copy of Gideon Blackblade you can win just from this video. To enter, all you have to do is leave a comment on this video, and the comment challenge for this giveaway will be whoever can come up with the most clever way to get Gideon's spirit to Theros. Hey, if you guys want a resurrection so badly, you're gonna have to work for it. The winner will have their comment pinned to the video, so hurry up and get your comments in before it closes. In order to win, you also have to be a subscriber to the channel and hit that like button and notification button. As always, Vorthos Army, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, see ya!